this is Dr. Price. She's on faculty here. She's uh, in the chemistry department. She's an atmospheric chemist. She's been involved in the whole climate change issue for a long time. And uh, she's been uh, nice enough to come and talk to us today. Uh, she's, she's used to talking this to crowds of people. So um, uh, it's a pleasure to have her come and talk to us. So please give her your <coughs> and undivided attention. Hey. So today, what I want to focus on, because I've heard you've already learned a lot about climate. So I'll start with the basics, some of the greenhouse gases. Uh, where are we so far on this path through global warming? It's already happening. It's here. So we'll talk about that. Uh, what are the impacts that we're already seeing in the world? And focus on Washington State. We live here. Right? The impacts matter to us where we live. Uh, and where are we headed, right? What are the impacts we've already seen? And then what are we looking forward to? <laughs> or maybe not looking forward to, but they're coming. Okay. So I'm going to stay on this slide for a minute. Are any of these greenhouse gases that you see over here unknown to you? Or which, which one have you heard the most about, I should ask? Which of these? Yeah, I'm hearing CO2, 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 right? That's one that's the, you know, the cartoon is in blue and green. Carbon dioxide is the greenhouse gas that, as a climate scientist, I am interested in. When I was working on my global, global chemical transport model, I was working on hydrogen and deuterium, but I was interested in how did this impact other, how did this impact greenhouse gases? Um, I actually, in my model, was interested in this. I was pulling in emissions from, of methane, because there's a connection between those two things. Um, but carbon dioxide is the one that we hear the most about, right? So CO2, I'm gonna, I'll start to write a list up here. What other ones have you heard of after that that people are like, oh, in terms of global warming? Methane. So methane, right? So that's CH4. Anyone know what this one is? And you've been to the dentist? You do know what it is. You just aren't making the connection. This is laughing gas. Yeah, so this is a really, really strong greenhouse gas. But as a climate scientist, I'm not too worried about it because it's such a small amount. CO2, methane, and water vapor is actually a very strong greenhouse gas, but let's think about why I'm not too worried about that as a climate scientist. So CO2, CH4, and water, these are kind of the big ones. They're why our planet, in particularly CO2 and water, why our planet is not a snowball. We have this thing called a greenhouse effect. Scientists have known about the greenhouse effect for more than 100 years. It's super basic chemistry and physics. So let's think about why is this the one I care about? Well, do you remember learning about the water cycle back in fifth grade or sixth grade? How long is that water cycle? Yeah, this cycle for water is just a few days, right? Three to seven days between when water evaporates, turns into a cloud. It's also condensable, right? You can condense water. Take your glasses and you can condense it onto your glasses. So water is a condensable gas. And it's not around for very long before it comes to what's called equilibrium, right? This cycle of three to seven days, this is how long it takes for it to kind of come back to equilibrium in the system. So if we make perturbations to this or changes to water, meh. You know, a couple of weeks later, we're, we're at equilibrium. Any guesses what this one's? How long it takes, or what we would call the cycle for this one? Because I'm more concerned about that one, <laughs> for sure. Do you think it's just a few days or a few weeks? Yeah, it's on the order of decades. So the methane cycle. It's about a decade for that. And what that cycle means is if I were to emit, and you have in lab your lab gas, natural gas, fracked natural gas, is methane. That's its principal component. So if you ever see natural gas, or if you have a, a stove at home that uses natural gas, that's what you're, you're burning. So that has 
about a decade. So if there were 100 molecules of methane that went into the air today, right now, 50 of them will have been reacted away after a decade. Hmm? What about the other 50? Well, then in another decade, half of those. So this cycle is kind of what we would consider a half-life, right? That it takes about that much time for these to go away by half. That's what, what we think about, OK? What is that turning into when it does react? So let's see what we've got going on with methane. Oops. So here's CH4. Here's your natural gas or methane. When this, I said it goes away, does it really go away? No, what does it turn into? Hint, 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 the thing that's circled up above. Yeah, this, through chemistry, just in the atmosphere, this goes through a whole bunch of steps, but the overall reaction is essentially this reacts with two oxygens Right, just gas in the atmosphere, right? We're all breathing 21% oxygen every breath you take. And over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, it's turning into CO2. What else do you think this is turning into? We're all doing combustion. What are we all exhaling? If you breathe onto your glasses, water. Right? We're all exhaling this, and we're all exhaling this. We're essentially doing the same reaction, but instead of burning gas, we're burning sugar. We're all doing this. <clears throat> and so this is essentially the reaction that's happening with natural gas. It's the reaction that happens if you leak natural gas, right? Gases leak. That's a really big reason why, as a chemist, I'm concerned about natural gas. This is a gas. And gases leak. Right? If you have a balloon, a couple of days later, your balloon is not as big as it was before because the gases, they can even leak through the pores in that, your rubber balloon, right? So, so these gases leak. So even in this reaction, right, this leaks, and when it leaks, it's turning into this anyhow. Right? So we've got all of these gases going on. So that's natural gas, or methane. And we've got our decade up here. Let's keep going with this one. So if this is a few days, this is a decade. Any guesses what that one is? is century. That one is centuries. Yeah. It sticks around for a long, long time. It's not condensable, at least not at atmospheric pressures that we live under, right? Condensable means, can I get it to go to a liquid or to a solid? The phase diagram for CO2, right? We all, if you've ever seen dry ice, I should put it, bring in a piece of dry ice, right? It goes from being a solid to a gas. It doesn't pass through the liquid like water does, right? Water goes from solid ice to liquid water to gaseous water vapor, right? We can feel it condensing. So this is, it's not condensable. It sticks around for centuries. And it's coming from lots of sources, <clears throat> okay? So here's natural gas, methane. I'll come back to this in a minute. Um, I wanna get to some of the other types of fuels, but first, I wanna talk about what's going on with CO2. What have you heard about changes in CO2? What's happening with CO2? It's rising. It's rising, right? So CO2, we've heard it. It's in the news. Right? We, in, on May 11th, we reached a new peak, 415 parts per million. And I'll talk about what that means. 415 parts per million for carbon dioxide in the air you're breathing, right? So every breath you take, if 
if you had a tiny balloon that had <clears throat> a million particles of air, molecules of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, uh, atoms of argon, <clears throat> every breath you take, 415 of those would be CO2. When I was born, that number was 326. When my grandma was born, that number was 295. So I'll show this again in a minute. Um, and if we go back in time, this is 800,000 years ago. So this is looking at ice ages in this picture here. Let me turn this sideways so you can see, or you can move if you want. <laughs> so here we are today. So I checked the levels of CO2. They're seasonal. So, you know, and they change a little bit each day. So today it's three, 413. A month ago it reached its peak of 415 for the year. See this red line that I have running across? That's 300. If we go back, and this is 800,000 years ago, we have to go back millions of years to get to the level of CO2 that we have today. Humans have never lived with this level of CO2, ever. Scientists just accepted a new name for the era that we are within. So each of these ice ages and warm periods, right, here's the depths of an ice age when CO2 is low. It's 180 here. And here's the height of the last warm period where it was maybe 280. So 180, 280, 180, 280. It's like a clock. It just cycles between the two. And so this little warm period right here, it doesn't look like much, but this was our Holocene. So let me write that word so you can see what I'm talking about. So the past about 11,000 years, this warm period, what's called an interglacial, was called the Holocene. And we would still be in the Holocene if it weren't for that big spike for where we are now. We humans now control the chemistry of the atmosphere. We now control the temperature of our planet. We now control the acidity of our oceans and the land masses and the biomass. We control it. So we're not in the Holocene anymore. We're now in what's called the Anthropocene. I first heard that term in 2004 from, I went to a talk when I was a, uh, at the time I was a postdoc at University of Washington in the program on climate change. And uh, the atmospheric chemistry crowd is not very big. And so uh, I got a chance to meet a Nobel Prize winner, the one who was uh, involved in ozone chemistry back in the 70s and 80s, Mario Molina. He gave a talk when I was doing research just outside Vienna, and he talked about the Anthropocene. It was the first time I had heard that term. And yet, here it is, 2019, and it took this long for scientists to say, okay, we will officially vote and call this the Anthropocene. Science does not move as fast as the world is moving today with the changes that are happening today, right? So this 10,000 year period, that Holocene, at the end of this uh, presentation, I've got uh, a cartoon that you're welcome. I'll, I'll put, post this on my course website for you folks to look at it. And it talks about history, human history through this tiny little 10,000 year period. This is where civilization came to be. What were we doing back here? We were hunter-gatherers, you know, these, and it, you know, you, you go back even to this part, so if you go back to about 13,000 years, that's when dogs were domesticated. 
Right? We didn't even have writing. We had some art. We probably had music and language and families, but we didn't have civilization. We didn't have writing and buildings like we find them today, and definitely not electricity. <laughs> right? So human history, written history, is very, very young compared to the geologic uh, time that our species developed in. And we're in a new era that our species has never lived under. Okay. So here is carbon dioxide going up. And like I said, it's seasonal, right? It peaks in about May. And then it gets drawn down through the spring as the plants take up carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. And then it goes up through the winter as the plants die and decay, right? So you can kind of see, I like to think of this as uh, uh, Richard Gammon, my PhD advisor, who was uh, one of the original authors of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, one of their reports, the first report in 1990. He used to look at this and he'd say, this is like the breathing of the earth, right? It inhales the carbon dioxide when it grows and goes through photosynthesis, then it exhales it as those leaves fall and decay and die, and you can see that breathing. And if you start here, the height of that breathing was nice and steady. And if you look at the end, it's much higher. The earth is breathing heavy. It's getting hot. And so let's look at how hot is it getting. Here is 1880. And this is just temperature. So starting at zero, we have to have a baseline. So we're going to start our baseline uh, as this kind of a, a, the previous century average. It will be our zero baseline, right? So through here is our average to start. And then you can see we got a little bit of a spike, and then it came back down. And then since uh, about the 80s, it's just been up. Right? We have warm years. We've got colder years. Right? It still has a little bit of a, of a bounce back and forth. You can kind of think of it as, I like to think of that ziggy-zaggy temperature as if I was holding my dog on a leash. And my dog is like the temperature as it goes back and forth. But I'm keeping the average. And it's going up. Right? Does that make sense where you can see it? it we have interannual variability. But what I'm interested in as a scientist is, what's the average? If I were to put kind of a smoothing through that, I can see that's going up. Okay. And we're one degree Celsius above what the overall average is. And there, right there, this little circle, this is the only colder than average year that I have ever experienced in my life when I was a toddler back in the 70s. If you were born after 1976, you have never lived on Earth during a colder than average year. Every year of your life has been among the hottest ever recorded in human history, going back millions of years. It's getting hot. Okay. So, do you notice a similarity going on here? <laughs> My dress is data. My dress is data from the Hadley Center in London. And I, got, I pulled this from uh, one of my colleagues there, uh, Ed Hawkins. You can look him up. He has created these data sets showing temperature change. This one's the global, so I'm wearing the global. He also made up one for Washington State, which is pretty fascinating. Uh, and he's got them for all kinds of cities and countries. And they all look like that. They all start out blue. And they all end up red. And that is showing a difference. So the darkest blue color stripes on my dress and in that are 1.35 degrees Celsius colder. And the darkest red is 1.35 degrees Celsius higher. If you or I were having a fever of 1.35 degrees Celsius, we'd be in the hospital. 
Children can have higher temperatures, but we, yeah. <laughs> we adults, we wouldn't be feeling so good. And so I, I, I'm on Twitter, and I, I posted this with my birthday, my life in CO2. So here's my birthday stripe. It's right around here on my dress. Right? Here's that last cold year that I experienced in my life. It was this one here. Here's where uh, I graduated from college, got married, and then my daughter was born here. And she's never seen a colder than average year. She will never see a colder than average year. So you can find yourself kind of on there a little bit. So what's going on? Where is this? Because right, that's global average warming. What's happening to our planet? And this is NASA, starting in, there's 1920, 1930, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, now you've all been born, <laughs> 2000, and 2016. So this ended in 2016 for this particular image. It's getting hot. And look at where most of that warming is occurring. Where do you see? Where is it the reddest? And here, I'm going to turn it to the next slide, because I think this one really shows where is it reddest. Yeah, either Antarctica or the Arctic, right? It's in these northern regions, and it's over land. So that one degree average rise it's not uniform. It's not like the whole globe just warms up uniformly, right? Just like your, your body, right? My, my hands are always chilly, right? Or the end of your nose is always a little chilly. And your cheeks are warm, right? Your body has different temperature regions. The globe does too, okay? And so we've seen, look at this, seven degrees Fahrenheit rise in the Arctic. The Arctic is, we don't live there, but it is where scientists are seeing the biggest changes in temperature. Huge changes. The, the Arctic is having a heat wave. Even, even this past spring, if you look up Arctic temperatures, there, it was uh, in Siberia, I think I was looking last week, it was 84 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, they're living it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, oil and gas exploration that happens in Alaska. And the companies up there, uh, a lot of their work is done where there's permafrost. How many of you have heard of permafrost? So wh what, it, what is that? It is like a layer on the, on the, layer. On the ground, yeah. Yeah, that's permanently frozen. And it can go down meters in some places on Earth. It, so permafrost is about 20 to 25 percent of the land area in the northern hemisphere. It's a huge area of our planet that is permafrost, permanently frozen. With that going on, what do you think is happening to permafrost? It's melting. it's melting. The scientists that go up there, they can smell it, right? This is old material in the ground that's decaying, and it stinks. <laughs> And the oil and gas companies, right, if you have solid frozen ground, you can drive on it. You can build on it. So the people that live there, their roads are starting to collapse. Their homes are starting to kind of sink into the permafrost. Scientists are losing their equipment as the permafrost melts. And remember I was talking about CO2? Has anybody heard about what's in permafrost? <laughs> There's lots, there's lots of carbon in the form of organic material. And there's lots of methane. The amount of carbon that's in our atmosphere, remember I said we've got 415 parts per million that we peaked at last month, about 413 today. There's twice as much carbon locked up in that permafrost. Twice as much. So we're talking about another 800 parts per million of carbon dioxide just from the permafrost if it melts. It takes a long time to melt permafrost, but it's already starting. And it's a question of can we arrest it? Can we keep it?
from melting, right? These are, these are the questions that our generation, right? Not our kids, our generation get to answer. We get to decide how much is going to melt. How much hotter are we going to get? Right? Because this is where we are today. We're not stopping. The emissions from the world went up last year. Not down. Right? And so climate is already shifting with these temperature changes. The Sahara Desert is 10% larger today than it was in 1900. It's grown by 500 miles since 1902. In just the 10 years between 1980 and 1990, the desert grew 81 miles to the south. Right? So 500 miles this way, 81 miles this way, just in 10 years. These changes are here today. It's already happening. Okay. These temperatures affect water, right? Water is part of the greenhouse effect, right? The, the, the climate cycle. And in my chemistry classes, I talk with my students about things called vapor pressure and Henry's law. And we learn that my students learn how to do calculations around, hey, if I increase the temperature, well, more water will evaporate. And we all understand this. You put a pot of water on your stove and you turn up the heat and the water evaporates. It boils if you get it hot enough. Well, we're doing that to the whole globe. And one degree over the whole globe doesn't sound like much, but it increases the evaporation of water. It increases the condensation of that water in clouds and boom, it increases the occurrence, the rainfall, right? All because warmer air holds more water. So our hurricanes hold more water, they evaporate more water, everything. It's, it's just, it's a feedback loop. Okay. Uh, this is one of my friends, Lilo Pozzo, at University of Washington in chemical engineering. And one of my previous students now works in her group. She's actually graduating from the chemical engineering department at UW. And when Maria, this cyclone, hit her home country, right, so uh, this is in um, Puerto Rico, right, she and her group went there with solar panels to help uh, the folks that were losing power. So I don't know if you heard, they had lost power for months on end. And if you have an oxygen generator that you're breathing off of, if you have emphysema, uh, if you have uh, diabetes and you have an insulin pump, you need power for those things. It doesn't take much power, but you need power. You need electricity. And so her group, she is a chemical engineer, and she works on batteries. And so she says, hey, I can bring over what I know. And so she brought over solar panels and batteries so that people could run small refrigerators to keep their insulin cold, to run their oxygen generators. It saves lives, right? Because if you don't have those, you, you, you can't survive. Um, in the Northwest, let's start to focus on what's going on with us. So this carbon dioxide, as it goes up, I don't let my kids uh, drink soda because do you know what the bubbles are in the soda? Carbon. They're carbon dioxide, CO2. If you have a little soda stream and you do that, zzz, 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 you fill it with the, get it to be bubbly, that's carbon dioxide. And the water in there, if you were to check the pH, anyone know what neutral pH is? Seven, right? Everyone hears, hey, seven is neutral. If you go down to one or two, it's acidic. If you go up to 13 or 14, it's basic, okay? So water, if it's neutral, it has a pH of around seven. When you add that CO2, you can get it down to two or three in terms of a pH. You can get it really acidic. And so I don't let my, drink, my kids drink soda because it's the acid that eats away at your, your teeth. Question? Where is Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I'm not sure you can look that up. Let me know where they get that carbon dioxide. Um, there's a lot of extra in the air. Maybe they can pull it from there, <laughs> right? So CO2 is, it doesn't look like it. A chemist, a, a, a first quarter ke a chemistry student would look at that and go, how is that an acid? And yet it is. It's what we would call a Lewis acid. And when you put it into water, it makes carbonic acid. 
So as we increase CO2 in the air, well, what do you think is happening to the water? It's getting more and more acidic. The acidity of our oceans have, has increased by 26%. Anyone ever taken an egg and put it into vinegar? What do you, do you remember happens to your egg when you put it into vinegar? Sometimes it's fun to do when you're in, you know, I don't know, it's kids. Dissolves. Yeah, the shell dissolves, right? So that shell is kind of like the shells of some of our zooplankton and phytoplankton that are calcareous. They're made of ca calcium carbonate. And in acidic environments, they dissolve. You're in, the, if you've taken or, uh, a geology class, you've done a test to see whether that rock came from life. Is it limestone, right? Limestone is made of shells that have been layered down and you dri dribble a little acid on it and it bubbles. You can see the CO2. And you push that equilibrium. And so those shelled organisms, right? This is kind of taking us down to, so Puget Sound oysters get affected by that. I'll come back to this slide again. I'm not a big fan of oysters, but We've got uh, oysters grown in our hood canal here in the Salish Sea, and they are shipped all over the world to Tokyo and New York and London. You know, they're a delicacy. And we used to be able to grow them in the Puget Sound from when they were babies and then harvest them when they were big enough. But we can't do that anymore. See these tiny little babies? You can see a fingernail to see how tiny they are. Those babies were grown in a building in Hawaii because our waters are too acidic. The, right, that 26% increase in ocean acidification means that those babies cannot naturally grow in our waters. Maybe a few of them would make it, but not in the numbers that they need to have commercial viability. And so now Taylor shellfish grows them in Hawaii and once they're about this big, they can survive in our acidic waters. We're not acidic, it's increased in acidification in our waters. Our waters are still pretty close to neutral, they're just acidifying. Okay. So back to this. So that's acidification, right? That's carbon dioxide. We also have land temperature rise. I don't know if you've been here the past two summers. What have you noticed the past two summers? Fires and smoke. I was born and raised here. I never saw smoke in the city until two years ago, ever. Yes, over on the east side, yes, up you know, uh, north and to, you know, east of the Rockies, but our rainforests are not supposed to burn. It's a rain forest. And now we're seeing big fires happening on lands that historically haven't had the, this many fires this early in the season. And it, a lot of it, it's being exacerbated, right? We've always had fires. That's not the issue. The issue is it's warmer. It's drier. That water evaporates when it's warmer. Right? If it's hotter, your water's going to evaporate. So the, the forests, the fuel that's on the ground, and the trees themselves, they're getting hotter and drier. So that when a fire does come through, it's going to exacerbate it. So in climate, when climate change is happening, we can't pinpoint and say that is because of climate change. But we can say that is exacerbated by climate change. It is made worse. And we're already seeing it being made worse. Okay. So some other, right, so we're starting to see smoke. It's starting to affect our snowpack. And then ocean temperature rise affecting our salmon and our orcas. Kelp forests. Let me show that one next. Oh, I didn't show the kelp forest. So our kelp forests um, are sensitive to temperature as well. And uh, we've globally lost about 95% of the kelp forests on the planet within the last decade. And I'll add that slide back in so folks can see that if they want. University of Washington 
released a report. This came out just a few months ago. And one of my colleagues, Amy Snover, she's the director of the, uh, this is the Climate Impacts Group at University of Washington. And she released this report. No time to waste. <laughs> Scientists are not ones to usually write things related to urgency. We're very careful in our wording. And for a scientific research group at University of Washington to use this wording gets at the urgency of this issue. Here's where we're headed. We already saw, I showed you this is where we were. So this is 2020. That's where we're headed. We've already warmed up by one degree. Over here, if you look, here's one degree. We're headed, and the, this report focuses on, hey, what if, what if we were able to stop at 1.5 degrees Celsius? What if? And I'm going to be honest. I think it's really unlikely we're going to stop at 1.5. We increased our emissions last year. Not even flatline. Not even decreasing emissions. We increased them. We increase CO2 concentration, right? Emissions and concentration are two different things, right? If we want to reduce concentration, we actually have to have zero emissions or a net, zero net emissions, right? So you have to pull out carbon if you're going to emit. We need to be at net zero emissions. And net zero emissions will then let us glide back down to a livable level of carbon dioxide. Oh, and the level of carbon dioxide that would have been a good one, right? We're at 415 last week or 413 today. We should have stopped at 350. That was the Holocene kind of perfect. That would have kept us from sliding back into another ice age for a while. Would have been nice and stable. We've blown through that. We're at 415. This level right here, 150, what level of CO2 do you think that will be that will get us there? 430. We're at 413. We don't have much room. Hence, the scientist saying, no time to waste. Right? That level, 1.5 Celsius, means about 430 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we're, right, that's going to be really, really hard to do if we want to stop there. So what does that mean? Oh, and these are the other ones. So, that, uh, so here's 450. So this would be that 1.5. Um, we're more likely, this is the path we're on right now, by the way. Right, we're headed for 1250. <laughs> On business as usual, if we you know, don't get a handle on it. I have a feeling that we're going to have an OS mo moment and go, ah, let's, let's, let's at least try for this one. And then maybe we'll hit this one. But this one is still pretty freaking scary for what this means in terms of CO2. This, it's not just temperature, right? It's acidity of our oceans as well. Okay. So um, back here. <coughs> What does it mean? Well, climate moves, right? We saw the Sahara Desert moves. This is where we're headed. Here's Portland, right? We're just a little further north. If we go with that high case, or even, let's just look at the low cases, because I'm really hopeful we're not going to do this. The, this level of CO2 would not be allowed in this room by OSHA standards. It affects our cognitive thinking. CO2 is something we exhale. It's something we do not want, right? It's a waste product for us. And when it goes up, it affects your ability to think clearly. And it's why it's controlled in air conditioning and in buildings, right? In this room, or I have a little CO2 detector, in my room at home, it usually is between 650 and 750 in a, in a room. In this room, you know, maybe it's getting up to 850 or 950 by the time we get to the end of the class unless we've got good ventilation. So this, as the outside, 
Whatever the outside is, add 600 or, uh, no, you would add about two or 300 to that to get what it would be inside, right? Inside's always higher. We're all exhaling CO2. So this is where we're headed. And I'd say look at the gray ones. This is what, how far, right? If you live in Minneapolis, if we follow that middle scenario, the climate will be more like Iowa City. Now, this doesn't seem like that big a deal until you get down here and you're like, Houston's already hot. Or you're in places down here that are already hot and you think about increasing the temperature. There will be places on the planet that people cannot live. It will be too hot. Physically, right? If, if you are outside and it's too hot, you cannot survive. You cannot do agriculture. You can't, right? Th there will be, and we saw desert regions grow. People don't live in deserts unless they have a lot of money to be able to have desalinization and irrigation and air conditioning. It's expensive to live in a desert. And for most of the population, that's just not an option. Here's what we're looking at for, so this is also from the University of Washington's heat waves. At 1.5, we're looking at an additional, this is global population exposed to heat waves, 4 billion. If we go to 2 degrees Celsius, this is what the uh, international negotiations are trying to get us to stop at is 2. Right now, we are poised to blast through 2 degrees Celsius. We're, we're, right now, we're, we're headed for 4, three, 3 to 4 Celsius rise. That's almost an 8 Fahrenheit rise in temperature. That's global average, right? That's not thinking about what's happening in the Arctic. So 2 billion more people are going to be exposed to heat waves. Seattle, we're already seeing it. I looked at the temperature data for Seattle for days that we've had over 90 degrees. And the historical average for up to about 1945 was three days of the year. Any guesses what the past five years have been? 20 days. Uh, too many. <laughs> it's tripled. We're at nine as an average over the last five years. So even here, our extreme hot days are going up, right? Three days you could handle not having air conditioning. But nine days? of over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, you, if you are elderly, if you have you know, compromised health, heat kills. And not everybody has air conditioning. And we're looking at just between here and here, 2 billion more people. Imagine going to 3 degrees or 4 degrees, where we're actually headed. Um, reduction in harvests, 10% reduction, 15% reduction. Decline in fisheries. And this is hiding the fact that ocean acidification dissolves shells. It shows up here. Decline in coral reefs. I'm not a biologist, but this is the data right here, this line. I should have like put this in red. This is what made me go, holy oh boy. Uh, at 1.5 Celsius, which we are going to blow through, most likely, we will see a 70 to 90 percent decline in coral reefs. Look what happens at two. 99 percent decline. That's a science, no scientist is going to say 100 percent. That's a scientist's way of saying they're gone. What happens when we go to three degrees, four degrees? These are the nurseries for these fisheries, right? These are the nurseries of our oceans are coral reefs, right? And then plants and animals. The, the UN scientists just released a report that, from the scientists about um, mass extinction, which is related to climate change in a way. It's happening at the same time as all of this uh, destabilization of our climate. Uh, we're in the, ma the sixth mass extinction event that our planet has ever seen. And it's happening right now. Between now and the next decade or two, the expectation is one in eight species on the planet will go extinct. One in eight. 
So it's related to this, but that's a whole different issue of biodiversity. Right? So we've got these two things happening at the same time. And they're related. If we solve this one, that one gets solved too. Or if we solve that one, it helps solve this. It's all holes in the same bucket. <laughs> but yeah, this, this right here, this uh, loss of coral reefs, I was like, oh boy, two degrees Celsius. It would be really nice to, and every 0.1 degree makes a difference, right? If we can stop at 1.9 or 1.8, maybe this number is 80. You know, maybe we can stop this at 95% and then that last 5% we can save and grow again as we stabilize things. Okay. Water resources, and then the cost. The cost of, doing, of, of each of these, right? This, these are those hurricanes, loss of fisheries, loss of right, tourism, right? Who's gonna wanna go to a dead coral reef? Nobody is, right? So these are losses, and then loss of GDP. And this is just at 1.5 and 2.0, which we are likely gonna blow through. So here's for Washington State, so you can see the little Washington thing. More hot days. This was released in, uh, based on data from 2017. Uh, so we're looking at a 67% increase in those hot days. Seattle, we're already <laughs> seeing that. Reduced snowpack, high winter stream flow, lower summer, and sea level rise. So this is just at 1.5, right? Remember, we're blowing through that. This number here for 1.4 feet of sea level rise, if we follow the business as usual, it's six feet. Right, if we keep going at the rate that we're going right now, we're looking at six feet of sea level rise. Miami is underwater, Bangladesh is underwater. You think we have a refugee crisis right now? Climate is a big part of exacerbating the current refugee crises that we're seeing around the world. If you can't grow food on your land because it's drier, you're going to leave. And these borders that we have all around our planet, they're new. They weren't here during the Holocene. We invented them through our civilization, our nice stable civilization, right, and our nice stable climate. But climate's not stable anymore. And when climate destabilizes during those ice ages and warm periods, humans move to where they can survive, where they can grow food or get food from the oceans. So if Bangladesh is underwater, where do those people live? Where do they move? If parts of South America, you can't grow your food because of desertification, where do you move? Right? So that's a big question, not so much for scientists, but for society. Right? Um, now, 2015 was a really hot year for Washington State, and it's an idea. It gave us an idea, a scientist, an idea of where we're going what 1.5 Celsius will look like. We had a big loss of salmon that year. We had lots of forest fires. And we're seeing that again this year. We're in a slight El Nino. Shorter ski season by 42%. I care about this one. <laughs> I like to ski. Uh, and we had a, uh, these temperatures, right? They reduce water. It, may, it stresses our agriculture. Um, so the next thing, I want to make sure I leave some time for questions. So here's where that's coming from, right? And it kind of brings me back to this. Here's natural gas. It's shown in blue. These are our known reserves. This is what we already know. This isn't including exploration for more. This is just what we know. And if we burn those, use them, look at where they are compared to between 1.5 and 2. If we want to stop at 1.5, can we burn it all? No. The carbon dioxide, the extra carbon dioxide in our atmosphere from you know, 295 to now 413 is from burning fossil fuels. A majority of it is burning fossil fuels. And our individual actions that we do, recycling, 
I'm sorry, but they're not enough. And I think that they make us feel guilty when we can't, right? I think that uh, individual action is super important. I do a lot of individual action. I've got solar panels on my roof. I've got, I drive an electric car. I try not to fly as much. But that is, if everybody did that, that's still not enough. And not everyone can do that. My parents are on Social Security. They can't afford to go and buy an electric hot water heater. Right? Most people can't. And how can we transition off of these without it being worldwide, without it being systemic? And so this type of a change, if we really want to stop here and have 70 to 90 percent decline in coral reefs versus they're gone, and we're already headed past this, right? Our, our path, right? Think of it as a tanker. We're in a, this tanker and we're emitting. How many miles do you think it takes to stop a tanker? Those drivers think ahead, miles ahead to put on the brakes. We have got our foot on the accelerator right now. Not even on the brake. We're not even stepping off the accelerator. We have got our foot globally on the accelerator to blast through both of those to use every bit of this, and we're exploring for more. <clears throat> right now, there is a lawsuit that is going through Oregon. Has anyone heard of Juliana versus the USA? Some of you have. So Juliana versus the USA is a group of 21 kids all over the United States who are saying, they're actually asking a question. Do you and our children have a right to a cli stable climate? Do we have a right to a stable climate? Because right now, the US government, according to the lawsuit, is allowing oil, gas, and coal exploration on our public lands. If you're a US citizen, this is your land that is destabilizing the climate. And these youth are saying, hey, wait a minute. These, oh, I'm running over time. Uh, you, you can't do that. You're destabilizing our climate. You need to stop. And so that's what the lawsuit is. And it's been going on for about five years. The, so you can keep, check that out, Juliana. Um, I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to leave it there. I did bring something, if anybody is interested. I have a colleague, my colleagues at University of Washington. They gave me a chunk of ice core. It is where some of that CO2 data came from. So um, you're welcome to come up and put your hands on it. You can actually see the bubbles where they measure the CO2 in those ice cores. Uh, I'll let you guys get to your next class. Thanks. Thank you. Right. And I'll stick around if anybody has questions. Kind of put your hand over it. You can see the bubbles in there. So do you see the bubbles now? Yeah. Yeah, so that, this water and that air, that's 3,000 year old air. It's from kind of the middle of the Holocene. This is old, old air in there. And if you listen, oh, this one's not doing it anymore. Fresh ice, when it gets pulled up, it crackles because that air is under pressure. And so it sounds like snap, crackle, pop. It's kind of cool. Isn't that neat?